Um, so hi everyone, um, I'm Christine Gatallo. I'm the Chief Librarian at Pequot Library. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's Author Talk with Lily King. Um, tonight's program is made possible by generous donations from patrons like you. We're so excited to welcome Lily King, award-winning author of five novels, including The Pleasing Hour, Euphoria, and most recently, Writers and Lovers. The Los Angeles Times writes, King's sentences are like layers of silt and pebbles condensed into sedimentary rock, distinct from one another, but fitted into an indestructible whole. Her stories, essays, and reviews have appeared in a variety of publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Vogue. Her novels have been published in 20 languages. Tonight, Lily King will be interviewed by her high school friend and classmate, Margaret Rick. Margaret is an avid reader and a member of Pequot Library's Meet the Author Committee. So I'd like to thank Lily and Margaret so much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you guys. Well, thank you, Christine. It's so much fun to see Lily, even if it's just virtually again. Um, I think last time you and I saw each other was dinner in Darien after you gave a chat about Father of the Rain. Oh, wow, yes. Um, wow, well, well it was a while ago. So, um, Lily and I, as Christine said, um, went to high school together. We graduated in a very small class of, I think, 54 um, in, I'm not going to say when. Um, and <laughs> It was a while ago. And, um, and Lily's moved around, I've moved around, so it's nice to be able to um, see each other this way. Great. Thank um, you so much for having me. And thank you all for joining us. There are lots and lots of Zooms that you could be on right now, so thanks for choosing this one. <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess we should, I think there are a number of us here already, so I guess we should get started. Um, I think my first question that I have here is just to give us a quick setup of Writers and Lovers. What would you like people to know about the book, both the people who have read it and those who are about to read it? Um, well, let's see. The book looks like this. Uh, uh, it is, it takes place in 1997. The, our narrator is um, named Casey Peabody and she grew up in Massachusetts and she's arrived back in Massachusetts in the summer of 1997 um, with a really badly broken heart. She's $70,000 in debt um, for, with student loans and credit card loans. Um, she has has a master's degree in creative writing and has just um she's been spending the past six years moving all around the globe really trying to write this novel um and her mother has just died and she's kind of a mess like she's she's really um she's 31 years old and she's reached that that point sort of at the very 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 end of your it's not exactly childhood but sort of your youth and you're trying to get to the rest of your life and you really don't really know how like she feels like she's a, a, a kind of the edge of this big abyss that she has to cross over to like find how she's going to be a real grown-up that can support herself and not be in debt and have a partner she's had kind of disastrous love affairs and um it's all kind of catching up to her um she hasn't had health insurance for a long time and she finally gets it through a job at a restaurant and um, uh, there are some things wrong with her and so she's kind of having a little bit of existential angst as well as um, professional angst as well as personal <laughs> angst. Um, so, but uh, that said, she's kind of, um, she is a kind of a quirky, funny narrator. So it's not like a really grim tale of someone kind of spiraling out, you know, it's really the story of, um, of, you know, how to overcome that time. Um, and also she's in this big, she gets into this, when everything is kind of at its worst, she meets two men and she's in this love triangle and, um, and that presents uh, some, sticky issues that she has to figure out as well <laughs> would you say that that is more or less accurate margaret yeah. You've read it twice now. Yeah, i think 
I know. Um, I th yeah, I think so. I think that it was, the one thing I will say is, I said this to Christine before, it was one of those books that you, I loved the ending, but I was sorry that it ended because I sort of wanted to keep knowing more about where things went. Um, and I don't want to say more than that about the ending because you really need to read it to figure out why things happened the way they did. Yeah. Um, so what do you think you were most interested in exploring in this particular book? You know, it's funny, you set out, you don't really know when you start writing a book, what, why, you know, you just, I just, usually I just have a set of characters, a situation, and I don't really know what I'm trying to explore. And then finally, draft after draft, I sort of, it sort of dawns on me what the book is really about and what I'm really trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something that comes first for me. Um, and I really don't like books that like hit me over the head, you know, with what they're trying to say. You know, I think that belongs in nonfiction. For fiction, you, you just want to be taken on an experience. Um, but I think, I, I, I initially, you know, it was that, that, um, that, that, that transitional period in life that can come at any age and it can come many times in life, but just, you know, how to, how to, when you feel stuck and how to get to where you want to be, you know, it can be really tricky. And so I tried to capture that. But I also think um, uh, it's a lot about the patriarchy. It's a lot about trying to be a female writer in a male world. Um, I would say that that male world doesn't exist as much as it did in 97. Um, and 97, you know, the whole 90s is when I was sort of becoming a writer and um, men controlled virtually all of the publishing houses. I think all of the um, newspapers that ran reviews, the, the literary editors were men, you know, they were, they were really the kingmakers. Um, and women were put in a completely separate category. And uh, I, I, surprisingly, I didn't set out to do that, but this is a lot about being a woman, a young woman in the world. Um, and uh, what you're kind of up against and, and what you feel, you know? And I, I really, I, I think I was really trying to capture that. I, I, and I think you did. I think, I think, you know, it sounds like what it felt like anyway was there were the Hemingways and the Judith Crances. Yeah. And near the Twain. And um, so I think you definitely captured the way that was feeling, at least to me. Um, so, Let's see. Um, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Mm. I think in fifth grade. Uh, yeah, my friend, um, my friend Amy Mix came into fifth grade one day and said that she was had started a novel, and she showed me her tablet. You know, that's what we called them, and uh, and she had written twenty pages, and I was like. Oh, I want to do that. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. Like I didn't never occurred to me that like a normal person could just start to write a novel. And so I went home and I just started writing a novel too. And uh, I don't think I ever lost that idea. Um, I just always knew that's after that, that's what I wanted to do. And we never had any creative writing in, in grammar school. But when I got to Pingree, when I got to high school, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Paulus, a uh, high school English teacher there, uh, taught creative writing to juniors and seniors. And um, I remember writing a short story for him in ninth or 10th grade and him saying to me, you should take my creative writing class. And that was it. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I just started writing, you know, we had to write three page, three and a half page short stories every single week. We did a lot of writing at Pingree. Yeah. Which so was great. Yep. So he just put me on the track and I never, I never really veered from it. Good for him and good for you. Yeah. Um, for not for not going the easy way, which I'm sure that there were other ways you could have gone that would have been a lot easier. Yeah, um, fortunately, they weren't very clear to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure they're clear to me either. So, and I didn't do that. So, um, curious, your last novel, Euphoria, um, which was inspired by the year in the life of Margaret Mead. Yeah. Um, set in Papua New, Papua New Guinea, I can never say that right, 
Um, this book is very different from that and sort of goes in a way back to a much more similar world as the first three uh, of your books. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what took you to New Guinea yeah. and then what brought you back? Yeah, good question. Uh, the New Guinea thing just, um, that really found me. Uh, I didn't, I just, I didn't, I never even took an anthropology class in college. I, um, I, all that happened was that I went to a used bookstore that was closing that a friend of mine brought me to and I I felt like I had to buy something and so I just picked up a old biography of Margaret Mead and um, and I I actually read it which is strange because I you know I buy so many books that I don't read and I don't really know why I read that but I was it was very compelling and uh, I got to one chapter and she was in Papua New Guinea doing field work with her second husband. She was 31 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and she'd married this guy basically because he was an anthropologist and she felt like she could do half, twice the work in half the time. <laughs> <It was> very <laughs> convenient. And, uh, and then she got there and they were there for a year, incredibly miserable. And then um, she met Eng the English anthropologist, Gregory um, Bateson and fell madly in love with him. And within, they talked for 36 hours and she fell madly in love is what she says in her memoir. And, uh, and so then they were in this love triangle, which I love. I'm a big fan of love triangles. Can't stay away from them. Um, and, uh, and they were in a love triangle for like a year and a half or two years or something in, you know, in this incredibly claustrophobic situation in Papua New Guinea, um, where they were often, you know, kind of fearful for their lives and for various reasons, disease and violence and that kind of thing. And it was just a, it was a short chapter. It was like eight pages or something. And, uh, I just thought like somebody's got to write this novel. Like this is a great novel. It's not going to be me because I write these like New England, you know, um, family stories. And uh, I don't write about, you know, people in 1931 who live in <laughs> huts, you know, and uh, with, uh, you know, I write about people with running water. <laughs> um, so I put that, I, I, I just had to find out more about what happened because I thought that situation was so interesting. Um, and then I started taking notes and I was writing Father of the Rain and that was an incredibly hard book for me to write kind of psychologically. And I kept on having to put it aside and then I'd go back to it and I'd put it aside. And all the times I put it aside, I would just read more about Margaret Mead because I thought it was so interesting and I was really secretly in love with Gregory Bateson. Um, I guess I read a biography about him and I think the author loved him and so I loved him. And, I just found him really compelling. And so I had to read all about him. Um, anyway, that, that's how I came to that story. Um, and then I, I really didn't think I would ever write that book. But then when Father of the Rain was done and I was done with my book tour, I knew I had to write something. And I had this huge notebook full of notes about Margaret Mead, so I thought I would try. Um, but it, it goes in a very, it's not about Margaret Mead. I just, I take a lot of stuff and I, totally fictionalize everything and you know uh and and so you, if you're looking to really find stuff about margaret mead that's not where you would go because it's not doesn't follow her life um uh and then and then i thought because i liked doing that and i liked going on tour and having people ask me about margaret mead and not me and like about her life and not my life it was it was like it was a nice kind of shield you know Mm -hmm. And I, I really liked that. And, and I really liked all the research and I liked combining the research with fiction. Um, I just thought that was fun. And so I started in on something else. It really, I did tons of research for months and months. I got 20 pages in and I was like, this isn't working. And then I got another idea that I was really into about an English writer in 1901 traveling with his mother in Europe. And, um, and then my own mother died. And I never could open that notebook again. And I have, I really honestly don't know why. It's not like, I mean, he was traveling with his mother, but it was 1901, I don't know. I, I just stopped writing and I really, I could not open that notebook. And, uh, and then like nine months later, this book just like poured out of me. And I, you know, I didn't write anything except for in journals. And then I just, I just had this, I had this idea of Casey and her situation and it just blah, like just came out. And I, I think, so 
sorry, I'm going to stop, stop talking in a second. No, no, no. I think it's because my mom's death was really sudden. Um, she was on vacation and she left in full health and there was no warning except for one phone call. And then two hours later she was dead. Um, and she was, she was actually in the South Pacific. Uh, and I think I, I, we were so close and it was such a blow that it just like laid me bare. And I think it brought up these feelings that I had when I was first writing a novel and I had just moved to Massachusetts and, uh, uh, or back to Massachusetts and, um, and was feeling so vulnerable. You know, I think in, in sort of a similar way as I felt when my mom died, you know, just, just like kind of vulnerable to the blows of life, you know, and, uh, and I think that's why this novel came up from, from that. And um, it, it just really redirected me. Well, and I think that rawness comes out very well in, in, in very, thank you, such a goofy word, but truly, I mean, it, it, it's very real it, that the way that Casey's feeling, it, it doesn't feel like it was written. It feels like it happened. No, oh, thank you. That thank makes you. sense. I really, I feel like I really needed a place to put my grief, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like, you know, it was grief that, you know, it had happened a while ago and, you know, I had a little bit of perspective. So I, mm -hmm. I wasn't like just dumping everything in there. Like I was in my journal for the first nine months, but, um, but I, I, I needed a vehicle. I needed a, a, a vessel, you know, for, for those, for those feelings. Um, cause they were so powerful and they're, they're so different than anything else. They're not like depression, you know, they're not like, you know, grief is, is so up and down with these huge waves. And it's so, it's sort of, sort of such an expansive feeling in a way, you know? I, I, I would imagine I'm fortunate not to have been through that particular grief yet. It, you know, it'll happen for everyone, but um, it definitely got very much a feeling of how that works mm. um, personally. Um, so what does your, we got a really good idea of what Casey's process looks like, her, her mm -hmm. logistical process. Is it similar to yours? Do you write differently? Do you set apart a time and place for your writing? Yeah, it's different in that I'm not, I, I, I used to be a very early morning writer like she is, um, but now I'm, I'm more kind of banker's hours, like, you know, nine to three sort of thing. Um, just cause I had kids and they just, they love those morning hours. You know, they just took them from me and I never have really reclaimed them, even though my kids are older now. Um, so I just got used to eating breakfast and making my tea and reading the newspaper. And then I go up. Um, but I, you know, when I'm, when I'm actively involved with writing a novel, you know, I'm extremely disciplined. I, I think, um, I think, you know, it is 99% discipline writing. It, it just is. It, it, there are so many incredibly talented writers that I have known, um, you know, in school. And uh, it's the disciplined ones who, who write books. You know, it doesn't, it, it's not really so much about talent. It's about just um, being, making that commitment. And, and also uh, suffering through your doubts, you know, cause it, it's, you don't, you don't have confidence that you're, what you're doing is any good for a really long time, if ever. And, uh, and I, I think you just ignore, you know, you kind of have to have the psychological stamina to ignore um, those voices that tell you it's crap because those are, those voices are coming at you hard every day. <laughs> I, I would imagine. How do you how do you know when you feel like you're done and you're ready to sort of send something off and out of your hands? It's really I mean, I go through draft after draft myself and I don't let anybody see it. Um, but it's really when I'm like, I can't do anything else. Like, I don't have one more idea in my head for this thing. You know, I have to show it to other people. So I usually give it to my husband first, who's also a writer. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I give it to my agent. Um, and then I give it to my, at this time, at the same time, usually I give it to my agent and my writer's group. I have a, a group of a few women here and, um, 
and they're awesome. And, you know, I give them three or four weeks to read it and then we gather and, uh, and they tell me everything that's wrong with it. And I just keep my mouth shut for two hours and I just write it all down. And, uh, and then I go home and I fix it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I, I hear what my agent has to say and then I give it to my editor. And then of course, then we go through more drafts. So that's kind of how, how it goes. But it's usually when I just put up the white flag and I'm like, I can't, I don't have anything else. I gotta find, I gotta need, I need, I need help. Um, so are you, you said, I think you may have said this already, but are you working on anything in particular right now that you want to talk about or, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and you don't want to talk about? It? Well, I will just say that this time is tough. This is a tough time to, to be writing despite the incredible amounts of time one has. Um, uh, it's, everything is very distracting and worrisome and all that kind of stuff. So those are my excuses. Um, and I've also, you know, been on book tour for this book and even though it's in my house, it still requires a lot of extroversion and writing a novel requires complete introversion. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a collection of short stories that comes out next November. So a week, a year from this November. So I'm, I, my editor and my agent have that, those stories now and I'll get feedback from them soon. So I'll dig in. And right now I'm just doing a lot of research for a new novel on, on taking notes. And um, yeah, I have a, I have a really wacky, wacky, wacky idea for a new novel. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, <laughs> hey. Wacky's fun. We yeah. like wacky. <laughs> very, <laughs> you know, very unlike me, but that's just the way it goes when something demands to be written. Well, okay. Um, so who, what writers, you said you read a lot, you buy a lot of books you don't read, but of the books that you do end up reading and loving, who are you absolutely loving and what, which of their books right now? Mm. Uh, so many. I mean, I, I, you know, I consistently always love, um, Elizabeth Strout, Tessa Hadley, uh, Shirley Hazard, who died a few years ago and doesn't have any new books out but I love her and read her over and over again and Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. um, Toni Morrison I'm reading Song of Solomon right now which I had never read before and I never thought that I would read anything better than Beloved um, but Song of Solomon is friggin amazing. Cool. Um, I just read a collection two collections of short stories by someone named Francesca Marciano um, who lives in Rome and she's a beautiful writer and uh, she's kind of my COVID discovery. Uh, I'm trying to think of what I missed. Um, that kind of, you know, those are, those are some of my favorites. And actually, I'm a big go back and rereader. Um, and I still, you, you can see quite a few of the books behind me. I've actually had since high school, college, um, there's a whole French section from Monsieur Le Flamme's class. Um, and what do you go back and reread? And if so, which? I do. I reread yeah. Virginia Woolf and Shirley Hazard all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Faulkner. Mm -hmm. um, I reread him fairly regularly. Uh, I, um, sometimes Marilyn Robinson. Like there's just certain people who really get me very excited about writing. Um, the, the, the two books I keep on my desk at all times are To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf and Evening of the Holiday by Shirley Hazard. I read those constantly, all the time. Cool. I guess I need to put those, put the Shirley Hazard one on my list. It's lovely. I have not. So I'm trying to figure out what we haven't, what I haven't asked you that I have on my notes. What, what, what else do you want us to know? <laughs> uh, I, um, so, Let's see, um, do you, if you'd like to read a short scene from the book, we would love to have you do that. Sure, I'd be happy to. I usually just read the first couple of pages. Okay. Because it's kind of easier to. It's a pretty good first paragraph. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so chapter one. Okay. I have a pact with myself not to think about money in the morning. I'm like a teenager trying not to think about sex but I'm also trying not to think about sex or Luke or death, which means not thinking about my mother who died on vacation last winter. There's so many things I can't think about in order to write in the morning. 
Adam, my landlord, watches me walk his dog. He leans against his bends in a suit and sparkling shoes as I come back up the driveway. He's needy in the morning. Everyone is, I suppose. He enjoys his contrast to me and my sweats and untamed hair. When the dog and I are closer, he says, you're up early. I'm always up early. So are you. Meeting with the judge at the courthouse, at seven sharp. Admire me, admire me, admire judge and the courthouse and seven sharp. Somebody's gotta do it, I say. I don't like myself much around Adam. I don't think he wants me to. I let the dog yank me a few steps past him toward a squirrel squeezing through some slats at the side of his big house. So, he says, unwilling to let me get too far away, how's the novel? He says it like I made the word up myself. He's still leaning against his car and turning only his head in my direction, as if he likes the pose too much to undo it. It's all right. The bees in my chest stir. A few creep down the inside of my arm. One conversation can destroy my whole morning. I've got to get back to it, short day, working a, du working a double. I pull the dog up Adam's back porch, unhook the leash, nudge him through the door, and drop quickly back down the steps. How many pages you got now? A couple of hundred, maybe. I don't stop moving. I'm halfway to my room at the side of his garage. You know, he says, pushing himself off his car, waiting for my full attention. I just find it extraordinary that you think you have something to say. I sit at my desk and stare at the sentences I wrote before walking the dog. I don't remember them. I don't remember putting them down. I'm so tired. I look at the green digits on the clock radio. Less than three hours before I have to dress for my lunch shift. Adam went to college with my older brother, Caleb. In fact, I think Caleb was a little in love with him back then. And for this, he gives me a break in the rent. He shaves off a bit more for walking his dog in the morning. The room used to be a potting shed and still has a loam and rotting leaves smell. There's just enough space for a twin mattress, desk, chair, and a hot plate, and toaster oven in the bathroom. I set the kettle back on the burner for another cup of black tea. I don't write because I think I have something to say. I write because if I don't, everything feels even worse. Thank you. <laughs> so great to hear it in your actual voice. Oh, and, uh, thank you. uh, the emphases where you wanted them, not where yeah. we read them. So that's yeah. that's sort of neat. You can just now read the whole thing for me. Thank you very okay. much. We'll do that. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> so do you have any thoughts? I know we have, I think we have quite a few writers um, on the call today. And um, I'm just wondering if you have thought, right, if, have thoughts for people who, like Casey, and perhaps like you, who are stuck in ruts and her, who are having trouble sort of either getting started or getting past a certain obstacle. Yeah, yeah great question. Um, what I do when I'm stuck is I replenish. Um, and I actually learned that from a therapist years and years ago when my kids were little. And I was, I went to her for like kind of a work life balance because I was not sure how I could have kids and be a writer at the same time. And it was very confusing for me. And um, she really taught me about replenishing that, you know, you can't just like, if it's just not coming at some point, you have to kind of step back and do things that inspire you. And so that is going to be different for everybody. What inspires me is reading. Like my favorite thing to do in the world is not to get up and write, but to get up eat breakfast, make a cup of tea, and sit in a really comfy chair and read for four hours, you know, with a pen in hand, you know, kind of taking notes in the back of the book or on a separate piece of paper, because I know I will get ideas. If I read a good book, my imagination will just start working. It's just inevitable. And so I'll just start getting ideas of all kinds, and you don't even know where they come from. Sometimes they're, they're not remotely related to what you're reading. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing that I'll do is, um, it's just, you know, it's just read and remember why I like to do this. And, you know, and, uh, um, you know, of course, like all the other stuff, like exercising and I don't know, looking at art is very helpful. Um, I just think all, all, doing all the things that make you possibly feel creative. Another thing that for some reason triggers a lot of um, my imagination is driving. Um, sometimes drive, driving, driving, listening to a book on tape or just 
driving, listening to music, I can really get a lot of ideas that way. Um, but I, uh, I think uh, just kind of, you know, stepping back and having some goals. And also, I mean, for a lot of people, looking ahead, like, you know, looking ahead to tomorrow and the next week and saying, okay, writing down your writing schedule and sticking to it. Like mm -hmm. I am going to write, you know, if you have a full-time job, then you're writing from 5.30 to 7.30 in the morning. Or if you're a night writer, you know, you're writing from 10 to midnight and you're just, you stick with it, even if you don't feel like it. I mean, I've done some of my best writing when I didn't feel like it. <laughs> you, just, you don't know what's going to happen until you sit down and you do it. And so I think getting a schedule is another really, really important thing. As long as you're replenished and feeling, you know, feeling ready. Um, I, I would say those two things are essential. And yeah. also, okay, one more thing. Okay. Really not paying attention to the critic. Like really, really psychologically thinking, okay, all of those negative voices, that critic in my head, out the door. Like shut the door on the critic. Mm -hmm. Critic is not useful. The critic is really useful when you're rewriting, when you're, you know, when you have a draft to work with, then you can bring the critic in. But mm -hmm. right now, you know, on the, the, the rough draft stuff, you just, you just, you just want your creative self to just, you know, spill it out and you can fix it later. It does not have to be perfect. You know, I think perfectionism is a really big problem with writers and um, just know that this is your crappy, crappy thing on the page. Um, I, I write by hand. And so I always know that anything by pencil doesn't mean anything. Um, right. so. so you write in pencil, not pen. I write in pencil. Erasers. Um, spiral like this. I, I'll show you. This is my, this is the first, um, the first page of the first draft of uh, this book. Is right oh, here. wow. I write a, a, cool. a spiral notebook. I write exactly like I wrote for Mr. Paulus, you know, yes. in 11th grade. But do you fold them in half lengthwise before no. you print them in? I do not. We had to fold our papers in a very specific way when we handed them in when we were in school. Um, um, like what I really like about it is like I can write in the margins and mm -hmm. I cross out. And I don't like writing the first draft in the computer because you have to make this decision whether you're going to delete or not. And you can't write in the margins. I mean, it's just my style is very different when I type um, than when I write. And I don't know about you and anybody else on the call, but I know when, when my kids were writing in school, and they, of course, wrote everything on their computers, and I'm sure your kids were the same way, I would always tell them, if you are going to edit your papers, print them out. Don't edit them on the computer. Right, exactly. Because um, exactly. you can see what you've done and what you've changed, and maybe you want to change it back. Yeah. So, um, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not writing. I'm just pretending. So just <laughs> pretending I'm a writer. I haven't been a writer since high school. Um, so we can open up, because I think I've reached the end of my particular list, but um, do we can open up, if people would like to ask questions, they can pop them into the chat. Um, or Lily, if you have a, a different idea, we are happy to hear No, I'm, yeah, the chat's good. <laughs> or, okay. or people can unmute and just ask them. Either okay. one. Um, so, um, and while we're waiting for people to post their questions in the chat, I have one, another sort of wacky question. Um, and this actually comes from, um, from one of the people on our book committee who shall remain nameless. Who would you cast to play Casey and her two guys? I am really open to suggestions. The only thing I have is Emma Stone. Um, I don't know a lot of actors for a female part uh, at, you know, who are 31-ish. I'm not, I'm, I'm not really so familiar, but um, I thought Emma Stone would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, um, all right, Christian Bale. I always want Christian Bale for all of, all of something. I have a role from him in every single one of my books, mm -hmm. but Christian Bale um, for Oscar. I yeah. think perfect, perfect. And I think, um, ooh. I'm not sure, I'm not sure about Silas, he's tricky. So my thought was Justin Long. Do I don't you know, know him. You don't know, I'll send you a picture of him. He's kind of, he's, um, 
well, I, I'll send you a picture of him so you can see who he is. Um, okay. after. Uh, and maybe the right age-ish? I don't know. So it looks like we have some questions. Yes. Um, so, Lily, you can see them, right? I can, yes. Okay. So do you do want? Um, so Kathy Gruen, who is on, uh, hi, Kathy. Um, she is actually on our Meet the Author Committee as well. Um, is asking as a former book publicist, how do you find virtual tour experience? Oh, <laughs> um, good question. You know, I have to say, I've loved it. I've loved it. I, 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 at first it was so weird. And like my first one was just horrible. I don't like the ones where, um, I can't see people or I can't at least see names. You know, my very first one was just me and, um, I think it was just me. I don't even know if they had gotten, you know, somebody to, to oh. answer and uh, to ask questions. And so I was just like talking and I didn't even know who I was talking to. It was terrible. Um, and, and awkward and blah, but I've gotten, I've gotten used to that. I've yeah, I've gotten used to a million kinds of formats and, uh, and weirdly, I mean, I, I used to just be really s missing that, that human contact, you know, and really feeling the screen. But I don't feel that so much anymore. Like I look at you all and I feel like I'm seeing you and I will go downstairs and have dinner with my family afterwards with this feeling of like having seen people and engaged with people. And I, I, I love not having to go to airports and stay in hotels and miss my family. Uh, you know, I have to say, I mean, you know, of course, like you take a huge hit on book sales. <laughs> Oh, but um but you know i got three months at home that i wouldn't have had so i i can't i can't complain and i think i don't know the ones that i go to you know my friends who have books who then i go to theirs mm -hmm. i love it i love it i just i love being in my kitchen i can make dinner i put them on the counter and i can listen to them and <laughs> i just think it's so fun you can see anybody anywhere and I think it's great. Yeah. Well, that's good. I, I think we've all gotten very used to screens standing in for people. Yeah. For the last six months. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, beggars can't be choosers at this point. Uh, you know? No, people in any form at this point are a beautiful thing. Yeah, exactly. So Stacy Abbott is asking, oh, this is a good question. What aspects of writers and lovers changed the most from early drafts to the finished book? Hmm. I would say it's more a question of adding things. Nothing really changed. I just added some things. Like I had very, very little about the mother and father backstory. I'm not a big fan of backstory. I do not like the chapter that takes us all the way back for 20 or 30 pages. Um, and I really didn't want to do that in this book. And so I kept it kind of, you know, mostly in the present with just a few thoughts here and there about them. Um, but my editor really wanted me to say some more things. And so I, I think we, uh, we landed on maybe, I added three or four pages throughout, you know, here and there. Um, and then another thing that was not gonna be in the novel was that kind of breakout chapter um, where she goes to the library and she reads about other writers and their dead mothers. That is something that I had on a separate file and I had hoped to kind of maybe work in throughout the book, like little, just little sections, one writer, and then, you know, a number of pages goes by and then another writer. Mm -hmm. But I, it didn't work. I tried it. I took it out immediately. And, uh, and I never told my editor about it. And I, you know, I just handed it in and then we were, we were going to press and the galleys came out, you know, which is like the cheapo paperback edition mm -hmm. that, that all the bookstores get sent. And I read it and I was like, I, I want to show you a new chapter. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you printed them all, but here you go. Yeah. And so, so um, at first we, we, I gave it to her and she was like, you know, I think this could be an essay and maybe not part of the book. And I was like, yeah, 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 you're right. And then the next day we both emailed each other, let's keep it in. And because uh, we both felt like, okay, this does belong here. And I'm really glad we did keep it in. So that, that was something that changed. Um, 
I don't, there, apart from those two things, there, there were, it was, it's all, we really haggle line by line, you know, and we really try to get every sentence right. And so, so we spend a lot of time just in the, uh, at the sentence level and not in the kind of big picture level after we kind of, you know, initially deal with those things. Right. So um, wait, I'm worried that we're missing um, the first, the one from um, Christine Catalo. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, Christine. <laughs> um, <laughs> as the boss of the show, you always have the right amount of detail so that the scene is evoked so perfectly, but there isn't a lot of description. How do you know which details to include? Yeah, it's really true that there isn't a lot of description because I don't like big blocks of description in novels. Um, especially, you know, in something like Euphoria and something that's researched. I do not want to see somebody's research go from their index card into the novel. Like that really bums me out um, and pulls me away and I can see it. So I, I really err on the side of less is more in terms of description. Um, and usually it's just the thing that remains. Like I might try a few things is the thing that I think is really, you know, the one that kind of nails the moment. I mean, that's that's what I'm going for. And I try to get rid of everything that's unnecessary to that. Uh, sometimes people complain that I don't describe characters' physical appearances very often. Um, and... Uh, and it's true because I feel like I'm playing Mr. Potato Head and I can't stand it. Like, you know, you have a thin nose and big eyebrows and, you know, <laughs> left part and a scruffy. I can't stand that. Like, so I don't want to be doing that in my head playing Mr. Potato Head. Um, and so, uh, so I, I don't do it. I try to just give one or two things, you know, about the face or the body or something so that because this is the real point that I should have said at the beginning, is that the reader <laughs> is actually doing the work. You know, I'm just giving a couple of details and you all are, you're, are using your imaginations to build the whole thing. Um, and that, that really is true. Uh, and that's what, as a reader, I want to be able to use my imagination. I don't want to be told everything because, you know, then what's in it for me? Where's my, you know, fun, creative time? And, and so I do, I, I write for that kind of reader, you know, somebody who, who wants to be participating and, and building it in their head and imagining it. And so I try to just give, you know, a few things along the way to, to, cre to create that atmosphere. Well, and I can't speak for everyone else, but I, I definitely was left with the impression that I can see Casey's shed. I can see Oscar's house. So it, it, I think by having the characters describe what they're seeing, maybe, rather than just a description. Right. It, it works so well. It really does. Um, oh, you seem to know the restaurant business so well. <laughs> Have you ever worked in the food industry yourself? I'm laughing because I know the answer. Years and years and years, from like age 19 to 32 or 3. 33 or four even. Yeah, 34. Long time. Many, many, many restaurants in many different states. Um, uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm, I hope you were a better waitress than I was. I was a disaster. Um, How long did you do it for? A very short time because I was so bad at it. I was that waitress you got and said, oh, God. This is going to be bad. You would have done better, trust me. Um, I don't know. I was better at retail. Um, so do you, do you know the plot through to the ending in advance, or do the characters lead you as you're right? The characters lead me. I, all I ever know, I think, is that I know the state of mind. I know the emotional state that the main character or a set of characters are in the various emotional states. And then I know that there has to be a journey, an arc of some kind. And then I know vaguely, vaguely where I want them to end up. But that, I don't know, there's, you know, anything could happen. It's just, I know the emotion. 
but I, I don't know the logistics and I don't know how they get there. Um, usually I have a few signposts. Oh, I'll show you this. This is another one of my like, little cheat sheet thingies. <laughs> I usually write like a timeline, you know? And so I have, I have like moments, just, just little moments that I want to get to. They're not like chapters or anything. They're just, they're just tiny little things, but they help me kind of take that, the character on that journey. And then, and then, you know, I just hope that it becomes clear. I, I certainly remember with this book being two thirds of the way through and thinking, I can't get to the end. Like I can't, I don't, I don't that's not going to happen. I'm going to have to give up this book. And then, and then inevitably, you know, I tell my husband and he's like, you always say that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This time is so different. This time is so different. He's like, you always say that too. <laughs> Back upstairs. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a struggle, but then, then it does, you, you get there. You just get there. You just have to trust. Um, so Mary Co says, thank you, Lily. I really loved this book. Can you talk a little bit about Casey finding solace and comfort yeah. through the geese in her neighborhood, how they eased her anxiety? That was so interesting. Um, thank you. That, that really means a lot to me that those geese were such a part of, um, of my experience when I lived, um, I lived in JP and I worked at Harvard Square, and I did ride my bike a lot. Um, and I also lived in, in, um, in Brookline for a while. And I was always, from both those places to Harvard Square, I was always on the BU Bridge, and I was always going across and on Memorial Drive. And there were always geese, and I loved those geese. I loved them so much. I, now, I know now that people hate them, and they, you know, uh, some Boston book group, you know, was like, oh, those geese, I hate them all. <laughs> so they couldn't really, you know, get into the whole geese thing in the book. But um, I, I just, um, I found them fascinating. And so when I started writing this book, you know, and had her going on Memorial Drive, I was like, oh, well, there are the geese. And then they, they very quickly, they became a source of pleasure for her. And then when she would have pleasure, she would think of her mother and she would want to tell her mother. And, and so that there was just this like connection immediately between the geese and her mother and joy and grief and all kinds of things. And, and it happened very quickly. Uh, and so, so you, when she would go back to the river, the geese would be there and then those thoughts would be there. And, and, um, uh, and, and they, it sort of just started to, to build. Um, I, uh, nothing I could have planned, but it just was there. And then I just have to show you because uh, my daughter, well, both my daughters are in art school, but my older daughter drew these geese for the book, which I love. That's so cool. Oh, it's so cute. That's awesome. I'm so happy. So. Proud mama. <laughs> Proud mama. Um, so Tim Wentworth, who Lily and I went to high school with Tim. for two years, um, has a question and I'm going to edit it. Um, did Mr. Paulus, rather than Professor Paulson, ever cut words like very or much out of your papers? He was notorious for doing that with scissors and papers would come back to students like Swiss cheese. All the time. I had so many varies in my paper. Yes, he had it. He had to bury the very, the bury the very coffee can, and you'd have mm -hmm. to put your berries. The, the, it was a hanging chad situation. It was. He'd go around to everybody in the room, and you were humiliated. Yeah, you had to put the very in, and he'd say, "How many?" Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It was a whole thing. It was. I have to say, to this day, I'm sure you, Tim, and Margaret, we all like when I use a very, I'm very uncomfortable. Very. 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 But I have to say, Mr. Pauls and I have a lot of emails and stuff. He uses very. He uses it. Do you, I hope you, I hope you um, send him something back with it cut out. I'm tempted. I should do that the next there, Yeah. <laughs> Tell him I said so. Um, Tim, Tim so, are you really not going to show your face? Are we not going to get to see you? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, it took me a while to unmute, mute, but uh, I lost my uh, laptop and this computer doesn't have a camera. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, nice. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so from LLJ to everyone, what struck me was the extreme depth of emotional moments. The painful moments were painful. Like Adams, I'm surprised you have so much to say and their kindness after Clark's vulgarity is making my throat hurt. Mm. I have that one quote tweeted. The desperation to find an answer to the unknowable, including asking physicians at the restaurant. I loved Casey because she was so raw and true. And of course the geese. I will always associate it with this novel with geese. Mm. Side note for Margaret, I could see the shed and smell the shed, yes. Uh, I also thought the fact that the dog did not have a name until the end was striking and wonder if that was purposeful. I'm sorry, I'm gushing. I love this novel. Well, that's oh, so thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Um, is there a question in here? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was just a gushing. <laughs> love your um, and oh, she said, ooh, last thing. I remember Casey looking at the river and people rowing, and it reminded me of Caroline Knapp, who is just the bee's knees, an amazing, oh. authentic female journalist and memoirist who left us too early. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. That's, she wrote a book about Cambridge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to say about that, that moment with the physicians, um, I kind of... I stole that a little bit from, from a situation. I put uh, a, a kind of acquaintance friend of mine in really early on after I heard about my mother um, dying um, on a small island in the South Pacific and nobody knew why, you know? And, uh, and you know, I had some theories and, you know, the poor guy, like he goes to a cocktail party and I, I, I give him my whole like thing about what I knew about my mother's death. And I'm like, so, you know, what'd she die of? And he's just like holding his drink, like, uh, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I felt so terrible, but that's, you know, that's the kind of thing you do when you're, yeah. when you're your mom. so I kind of turned it into two doctors coming into a restaurant and, you know, I, I, I have to say it's one of my favorite scenes because it came out really quickly. And I love that you take a little kernel from your life, um, but then you make two completely, like neither of those doctors were like that friend of mine at all. Mm -hmm. but, you know, you just take a little something and you make it into something else that in some ways feels more real, you know, even than what happened to you. And I just love that. I, I, I know that's why I write for that kind of thing. And I'm sorry, I'm LLJ. <laughs> And, and it, w it was um, it was a comment. I like I said, I gushed. But um, so nice. I think the question was the the juxtaposition, the depth of the feelings. Um, the stuff that was painful was brutal. Mm -hmm. Like the guy in the kitchen that was so awful, and and like getting physically scalded as well, and then going out and having somebody look at you kindly. And I think everybody can relate mm -hmm. to how, especially in the time we're living in, how small kindnesses can, can make your heart feel like it's in your throat. So true. And also just looks and, 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 you know, or, you know, the absence of that can hurt like to the deepest depths. Yeah. Yeah, and I felt that in your book. So the question, I guess, was, um, you know, how did I wonder how you got that across um, when you were reading and rereading drafts? Mm. Could you also feel that level of emotion in your own words? That's my question. That is a really good question. <laughs> I think so. I, I, I mean, at least I think sometimes I feel it while I'm writing it, you know, and sometimes I feel it three or four drafts later. I, I don't, it's a funny thing um, how, how you can create something, you know, almost not exactly numb, but you're, you're thinking about the mechanics and you're thinking about a whole number of things. Um, and then it moves you, you know, several drafts later. I, I, I don't, I don't exactly know 
why. And then sometimes like I can write something that will make me cry, you know, right then and there. And, uh, and, and I, I don't know, sometimes you're just, you're connected and sometimes you're not, but really it's when I write, that's all I'm interested in. I'm, I'm really, I'm just interested in, in the emotion of it. You know, I don't really care what, what else I, you know, I don't need to create a murder or a, you know, that kind of a plot. I just put in some kind of plot because people like to read that kind of stuff, but I'm just interested in the emotion and, 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 and trying to capture and the juxtaposition in life, you know, like every day can just like bring us to joy and sadness. And, you know, we're just whipped around. And, and I, I, I think that's, that's so important to capture, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Christine, did you, I know we're getting to the end, Lily, and I don't want to keep you forever. I know you have downstairs to get to and, and people, but um, Christine, did you want to say anything to wrap up? Sure. Just um, thank you so much, Lily, for uh, talking with us. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'm so excited that you were here with us and I know our whole community is as well. So thank you. And thank you, Margaret, for interviewing her and putting us in touch. So and thanks everyone for joining us. So. Thank you, Margaret, so much. Thanks, Lily. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. So